Bonjour, my name is Jess and I'm from uh, Sault Ste. Marie. I'm a member of Batchewana First Nation and um, that's home for me. Uh, I work for the 4Rs Youth Movement as the Executive Director. Um, and the 4Rs is a, an organization that started in 2014 as an opportunity for us to engage Indigenous and non-Indigenous young people in relationship building uh, across the country in support of reconciliation. I think our, our programming is is really centered on the belief that young people need to experience something together in order to build relationships that transcend events, um, transcend funding agreements, transcend the parameters of a program, um, and that we really need to come to understand our identities and the pathways that have led us to, to really decide that reconciliation is something that is important to us. Um, and so we use face-to-face -face dialogue um, as, a, as a tool for us to be able to start to engage in those conversations and, and build those relationships. Um, and we see young people, we work with young people between the ages of 18 and 30-ish, um, young people who are like influencers in their communities and the spaces that they're, they're starting to enter into so that they can start to shift systems, shift the conversation um, based on how um, how they want to see the future to, to, to be. Like we work with young people between 18 and 30. Um, we really focus on bringing people together like face to face. Um, and um, like location and geography and land are really important to what we do too as well. So in the conversation about reconciliation, we can't be leaving out those things. So as much as possible, we're out on the land or away from the city so that we can, uh, I think, begin to feel what it's like to, to decolonize our minds through reconnecting with, with the land. Um, and that's where our conversations flow from. Our programming uh, uses an intersection of um, indigenous knowledge, arts-based methodology, um, and social in innovation um, practices to think about the systems, to, to bring people together to convene in difficult conversation. Um, we really focus on like people thinking about like who am I in relation to the conversation about reconciliation. Identity is such a big part of our communities as Indigenous people as something that's been taken away from us um, and also something that we know that we can rebuild for ourselves but not not alone right and this also is opportunities for us to really come together with other like-minded people who are on that journey of discovery together um, to, to pick up the things that have been lost but are there for us. Um, we, we really work with young people to hold conversations that are relevant in the context that they're in. So we have developed a framework for cross-cultural dialogue that really helps us to, to imagine, um, to think through the ways in which that we can safely engage Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in conversations about colonization, in conversations about the history, in ways that actually center the Indigenous young people's needs um, their perspectives, their stories, um, but also gives opportunities for non-Indigenous people to connect themselves to that too as well. Um, we, um, we've worked with young people in the health system, we work with young people who um, are, are on reserve, off reserve, um, uh, conversations between Indigenous and um, newcomer youth, Indigenous and people of colour, um, as different conversations than you would have with Indigenous and, and, and white, uh, white young people. I think the aim of the program really truly is meaningful relationships. Um, we have grown up in an apartheid system um, and so there aren't a lot of spaces that exist just naturally for young people to come together. I think universities are great places for that to happen as young people have, start to have agency and start to, to question things. But um, for the generation that we're working with, oftentimes we haven't been educated about our history, even as Indigenous young people. And this is a place for us to, to talk bravely and safely about those things. Um, and to think about like how can we start to, to push back against those things together. Um, and what we're really trying to do, I think, is create um, a social infrastructure of change makers across the country uh, who understand and can relate to each other by doing that hard work about who they are. Um, and so we really encourage those kinds of conversations and, and uh, use tools and, and facilitation techniques that support that. Yeah, one thing I think that is exciting about the work that we do is, is that we work both in community and like across the country and so giving young, uh, in particular young Indigenous people the opportunity to, 
to leave their community, but to come back with um, new ideas, new experiences, but connected in uh, a deep way to the young people that they've met. So they're going back to, into their communities, but they feel a support system around them, even though um, geography is, is in the way of that. Um, there's some things that we've learned about how we can really um, create family. Uh, it sounds really cheesy, but it's like, it's like we actually need to, to, to start to create family and build family as, as a way to think about building community and building networks. So I think it's an example of um, how to work in complexity and emergence. Um, because when you bring young, even when you bring Indigenous young people together, you don't, um, without a prior like relationship with them or, or knowledge of their history, um, you don't know their story. And so you really need to be um, as, I guess this is really what our, our work does, is help to build capacity of young people as hosts of conversation cross-culturally. Um, and so these young people need to, to be sensitive and considerate of all of the different intersections that young people might bring into a conversation about reconciliation. And so it's about meeting people where they're at, but also, um, and I've said this before, it's like centering the needs first and foremost of Indigenous young people in those spaces. Um, so I think it's an example of how you can um, use a framework as a basis for how you might teach or, or um, build an experience with young people together, but not something that's a step-by-step -step guide. Um, it's, it's about like values and, and a different way of, of experiencing, um, I keep saying the word experiencing. Um, really what we try to do is, is to create conditions for the collective knowledge of a group to define what the learning is. Um, and so we need young people who, or we need facilitators, we need people who can host conversations that allow for that magic to emerge. And our framework is a way for us to think through how we can design those experiences together. Um, and there's, there's different, different things that are, that are important in doing that. It's like a big team. Like there's not one person who holds all the answers. And so your team of facilitators also needs to represent the diversity of the young people that are there. Because young people need to see themselves and who's sort of leading them and they need to be able to trust you to be able to hold that conversation to, to, to be considering what they might need. Um, working with um, culture and ceremony is like part of what we do too. Like that's really essential that we have that space for that spirituality to, to enter into these conversations is some place that I think Western education really shies away from. Um, and as I, I spoke about before too, the other teacher that's in the room is, is the land. Um, and there's so much that um, uh, the earth can teach us about what the relationship is that we need to strive towards because of what we can see and we can observe by being out on the land um, and being in conversation with each other. And conversation could be silence, it could be walking through the woods, um, it could be, um, you know, uh, learning about the medicines and the plants and that healing that 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 has to offer us and the healing that we have in ourselves to offer each other. And so we really work with those kinds of um, I guess fourth dimension aspects of energy that, that are out there for us. And to me that's what Indigenous education could be. It's like that's any time that I've been able to spend time with elders, it's like that's uh, an elder, an educator is a conduit for, for, for that level of knowledge. Um, and we're not there, I mean that's like master level stuff, right? But it's like those are, those are the, the things that we, we want to work towards. And, and what we try to support each other to learn more about to bring into these kinds of conversations. Reconciliation, reconciliation, reconciliation um, is, is like a, a buzzword used ad nauseum. And so um, it's, it, it actually has shifted and it's challenging because Indigenous young people are disconnecting from this conversation about reconciliation because the way they've experienced it, um, and I think that the way that they've experienced it is that again, their voices are not as important as others. Um, and so um, I think that what 
um, the impact that I, I have seen when we're able to really um, Um, the impact that I see when we're, we're really able to uh, like animate our framework um, to the best of its, its um, um, I guess, potential is that you have young Indigenous people um, stepping up and into their leadership in like new and exciting ways. Um, an example of that is um, a young woman um, coming to understand what her Anishinaabe name meant by being a part of something that we did. Like it helped to further her story about her name based on how she was able to show up in that conversation. Um, I think like that to me is like success. And it's very, it's very hard to measure that too, right? And everybody wants to know what are your, what are your outcomes? A lot of this stuff is that we're just actually just, um, we're really not sure like the work, the, this, environment of reconciliation is so new and so fragile um, and uh, we don't know what the outcomes are. We're just actually just really um, trying to to do this work from a place of deep in integrity um, and accountability to our communities and, and to the people that are part of this found family. Um, you know, yeah, we, we've tried developmental evaluation um, and it's tried to box us into a different kind of way of looking at the world. Um, we're now sort of exploring the metaphor of seed saving as a way to look at our evaluation. We've tried different kinds of evaluation models for four hours and um, probably over the past year we've been kind of turning into the resurgence of the um, work of, of um, Indigenous people in food sovereignty and, and, you know, seed saving has been something that our communities have done for thousands and thousands of years. The seed savers, the people who were responsible for that, were responsible not only for um, the harvest of the community that season, but also the generations beyond that. So you're always thinking about, you know, what are we saving now for our families now, but also into the future. And so if we think about evaluation that way, we're, we're able to um, use that metaphor of seed saving to really like um, um, expand what we could think would be possible for impact. Because it's not only about what we're doing now, it's about what planting those seeds will grow for the generations in the future. Uh, so that's kind of some, an experiment that we're doing right now around like evaluation is like what does evaluation look like if we think about it in the metaphor of seed saving and there's knowledge holders around seed saving all across the world too um, you know um, and we hope that one day we'll have a seed bank that people can actually like access whether it's a physical thing or what it would be but it's like you know and, and in some in some communities seed banks you can take from a seed bank if you give to the seed bank um, so there's, there's that um, reciprocity embedded in, in that, that is, um, to me, um, deeply indigenous. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that's how we're trying to shift evaluation. If I think about, like, someone like Shaquita, uh, I think that, like, what Shaquita's experience was like was um, strengthening the solidarity between the black community and in the indigenous community, and the realization that although our stories are very different, we have experienced colonization in a way that has um, placed our communities in a certain standing within society. And that there is a place for us to work together to liberate both of our communities if we could find that connectivity to that story. Um, and so I, I think that like working with um, like Shaquita as part of our, our steering committee, um, uh, the reciprocity to that is that for Indigenous young people, we can learn about that too, you know? Like we can learn about the black community, we can learn about like how diverse the black community is within Canada and the stories of the diaspora and um, the fact that some people, because of colonization, actually don't know where home is. Um, and so we can also recognize the privileges that we have to know where our home is and where our land is. So to me, like those things are so special for, for like that fabric of relationship that is the foundation for what Canada could become. Um, so, 
Yeah. <laughs> wow. um, yeah. And I mean, like, non-Indigenous young people who are part of our programming, I think, are, are always very grateful and blessed to be in the presence of Indigenous young people who are able to step into their leadership, because that is such a gift to be able to see that and to be a part of that. Um, and the things that they're able to, to learn um, about the history of Canada, but also the way that they can now see the world because of um, uh, that perspective that they've been separated from for so long uh, is also like such a, a valuable thing. It's like a piece of Canadians that has been missing and they don't even know it's missing. Um, and a lot of non-Indigenous young people are angry you know, it's like once you start to actually reveal this history, like we, we, <laughs> we're, we're born knowing this to a certain extent, um, but like non-Indigenous people, when they find out, they're enraged. Um, and this gives um, them an opportunity to work through relationships to actually take action on that anger um, and to open the doors to places where they have access to that Indigenous young people may not. Um, and that's that social capital that is actually what we need to spread around because it's the social capital that actually decides who's in and who isn't, who gets the money and who doesn't get the money, who gets the opportunities and who doesn't. Um, and so I hope that what we're doing is actually not necessarily something for this generation, although we will, we will start to see, like, we will start to see the harvests of what we're creating now, but really what the work that we're doing is for my nephew and my nieces. Um, and so when they start to, to, to step out into the world outside of the safety of their, their homes and, and, and their schools and, and that sort of thing, that they have a very different experience about their identity as Indigenous people. Here's how we can measure like our impact is like, are our children friends? Like, will our children be friends? And will we have tea together when we're in our 50s? It's like, to me, that's like, because uh, having a relationship with somebody that is is um, impersonal um, and professional um, gets you so far. Um, but having a relationship um, with someone that's at, at the level of love is, is a place where you will call that person out on their bullshit because you love them. And that person will hear you because they love you. You know, but you'll also invite them into your life and your world, um, and like that's where that the the apartheid starts to to break apart. That's where the Indian Act, in a way, starts to break apart. Um, you know, we focus so much on trying to like dismantle the Indian Act, but there's possibly other things that we can be doing outside of that. So the Indian Act is irrelevant no matter what, because we've built something completely different than what was even possible through dismantling the Indian Act. Definitely would love to share with you our framework for cross-cultural dialogue. Um, you know, over the next sort of, I'll say five month period, we're um, doing a lot of writing and reflecting about what we've been learning over the past year, which we'd like to also share to the world. Um, uh, some of what we do is, is open source, so it's available for everyone. Um, but we have a lot of internal documents that we use for our facilitators, and we don't share those with the world because it's important for us to, one, connect, to have a relationship with these young people who want to use these tools, mm -hmm. and to be there as a support system for them as they, they adapt them for the context or the conversation that they're looking to have. Um, and when, when people can access things um, without having done some of that groundwork, um, that's when things can actually be dangerous, especially for Indigenous young people or racialized young people. Um, and so we've made that conscious decision to, to not do that for everything that we, um, like all of the facilitation tools that we use. The way I, I like to sort of put it is that you can change all the curriculum in Canada to include um, Indigenous history, Indigenous stories, um, and Indigenous perspective, but if that, that content is still being told from a racist lens, or an ignorant lens, that's what you're imparting on young people. They're, they're actually being empowered with knowledge, but they're still upholding racial stereotypes because of the way that that has been taught. Um, and so like, to me, that's like still also a very like, that can be a, a tricky thing. 
Um, and I don't know what the answer to that is, is because I think, yes, we need to have that curriculum in our schools, but we also need to work with teachers um, so that they believe in what they're teaching. Because that's also the problem, I think, is that they don't believe in the value of, of why they should teach about Indigenous people. I don't know. I don't think I've experienced Indigenous education, you know? I've experienced, like, Indigenous-led things, um, but they're all within the Western system. Um, and I think probably the closest thing that's an example of something right now is um, uh, Nim which is a land-based culture camp that has elders living there who you're cooking with, you're um, setting snares with, you're actually building relationships with like over time. Um, and I think that like, I just went there for one day and played go fish with a with <laughs> one of the elders there and the amount of, of like um, language uh, proficiency I guess this is such a snobby word the amount of language proficiency that I got from saying go fish <laughs> um, but like uh, it hurt my brain in such a good way it was like oh I needed this, you know, it was like working out my brain and I was just playing a card game for maybe an hour um, just and a just a card game, you know what I mean? It's, uh, it's, it, it really like, I guess the closest thing that I can think of that is Indigenous education is land-based and experiential, where the language is deeply, where the language is connected to what we're doing because it's not, um, it's not just about like what we're learning in English, it's about expanding our understanding of, of, um, of it through our own languages. How would I define the word indigenous? Um, I, um, I, you know, it's a government term that's used to umbrella indigenous people and whitewash us. Um, but I also, I also think of indigenous as of the land, mm -hmm. like the, the roots of that word speak to um, the people of the land. Um, so I am indigenous to this land, um, and so I like to think of, of, of it in that way. Um, but, you know, I'm Anishinaabe, and that's really important for people to, like, uphold that um, and to challenge uh, non-indigenous people to, like, do the work to just find out where you are or find out who that person is. Um, and it's very easy for people not to do that, you know? Um, so indigenous, indigenous is like a loophole. <laughs> because we work with like a diversity of indigenous young people, um, it's a way to, to, um, to represent First Nations, Métis, Inuit people. Um, with one word, I guess. <laughs> Just one word. Uh, yeah. It would be, I like, what would be the future of that word, you know? Like, that's the thing that I think is kind of interesting. Um, like, maybe, but, but here's the thing. Like, we're creating an, an Anishinaabe school in Bawatin. Um, it isn't an indigenous school. It's an Anishinaabe studies, you know? And so, like, that is, like, uh, I think where we need to like root that education in the um, teachings of those nations to which that land has been stewarded for time immemorial. <laughs> there, are no there are no time constraints to your learning. You're living your learning. Uh, that's probably the future of Indigenous education. If I could speak my language fluently, it would probably be the biggest one. Um, I'm all, like I'm. I'm limited. To, I'm limited in my capacity to envision the future that I would like to create because I can only speak English. Um, I think that the evolution of the human, like the evolution of humanity, is is limited by the languages that we speak, and because we only put pennies into the resurgence of indigenous languages. We're actually shooting ourselves in the foot for the future of this country, I think. Because in that language is unlocking the key to climate change. 
is unlocking the key to um, disease and disease pre prevention, is unlocking the key to social justice inequities and, and the way that we just treat people. Um, we don't have the language for it in, in English. So, yeah. <laughs> that. <laughs> Um, interestingly enough, I was on a panel with a guy named Indy Johar, and he works for this organization called Dark Matter Laboratories in the UK, like in London, and we had this talk about um, computer programming and the potential of technology, um, and we've reached, we, he was talking about that we've reached actually um, uh, a ceiling in our capacity to code because our language can't keep up like our, our, our verbal language can't keep up with the concepts that are possible to create through computer coding. But then the conversation that we had was, what if we were coding in Anishinaabe? Like what would be the matrix style computer programming that we would be able to create? So to me, the young people of the future, like young Anishinaabe people, will be coding things that will like finally develop a time travel machine or a teleportation machine, which is what I could use because I'm on the damn plane so long. <laughs> it's like, you know, like that's, that's the future of, of technology is in the language, all sorts of different things.